introduce our special guest for this evening. I thought I'd let you guys know what we have in store um, for the rest of the week and what other amazing guests we're going to be chatting to. So tomorrow we are doing another fun interactive quiz and some club size with Lisa before an amazing learn to code skills club with Josh and of course some more acts of kindness with Georgie. We're then going to be hearing from the inspirational philanthropist and businessman Gerald Ronson CBE. On Wednesday we will once again be playing bingo and doing more aerobics with Joe before a skills club with cartoonist Paul and acts of kindness with Tyre. And then we're going to have the pleasure of welcoming the amazing Rachel Anticoni, the operating officer at the Royal Free Hospital. And if that wasn't enough, on Thursday, we're going to be doing Arts and Crafts with Rachel, Dancing with AJ, before an online safety skills club with Maccabi and Acts of Kindness with Levy. We're then going to be chatting to the amazing chair of Jewish Care, Stephen Lewis. But tonight, before all of that, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our special guest. Katie Glass is a world-renowned columnist, sorry, feature writer and cultural commentator, and the recipient of the first ever Young Stationers Prize in 2014. London born and raised, Katie started as a journalist working as a reporter for the Daily Mail in 2008, before moving on to the writing features for the Sunday Times in 2010 a role she has held for the past decade. Through this role, she has covered stories from Egypt's only women's roller derby team to the future of cruise lines due, due to the coronavirus, to the legacy of the troubles in Northern Ireland and the future of veganism. She even fam famously chronicles, sorry, her travels with a former Judge B virtual guest, Judge Rob Rinder, aboard the Transmologian train line, which went viral. Katie is also the founder of The Other Club, a women's networking and event space seeking to flip the balance of men and women to allow for a wild discuss wild wider discussion of women's issues and world issues. A leader in feature writing, Katie, Katie has also recorded documentaries, including her latest, which detailed her exploration of her own Jewish identity on finding out her father was Jewish when he passed away. We are very, very excited to learn about her journey and her entire career in journalism. Can't speak. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's very, very special guest, Katie Glass. Hi, Katie. How are you this evening? Oh, you're not muted. Hopeless. Did that work? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm brilliant. I said I'm much better after that introduction, which I think has made me sound more interesting and important than I really am. But that's, yeah, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. This is great fun. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you on the show tonight. Um, so how has lockdown been treating you and how are you keeping positive? Oh, that's a good question. Um, actually, well, um, I hate to say it, but as a journalist, there's this sort of joke that when anything bad happens, it's obviously a great story. So I think that's how I've been keeping positive is that every time something, you know, dramatic happens or something bad is happening in the world, I'm thinking, well, you know, that's I'm thinking of it with interest. So I guess I'm finding a lot of interesting things happening. Um, as you mentioned, like I wrote a thing about um, the, the cruise ships and how coronavirus has affected them. So I've been very, very busy working. Um, and also, like, I've actually found it a really creative time. Like, the thing with writing is often you have to just, you have to just do it. You just have to sit on your own and write. And uh, actually, I've had so much time just to sit on my own and write. So I've been sort of tapping away. I think I'm, I'm more worried that I've been too happy during lockdown. And when it, it's all normal again, I might sort of miss my time on my own. <laughs> Um, so, we're, I mean, we're very pleased to have you on Judge Be Virtual tonight. Um, we've been boosting positivity and keeping children and their families active, healthy and entertained for 13 weeks now since lockdown began, with the help of a special guest like you joining us each evening. So you were nominated by your friend, Rob Rinder. So why do you think it was important for you to join us this evening? Um, I think, well, I... Like I say, I've loved lockdown. <laughs> or I've, um, I think I have quite a positive energy. That's probably why Rob's nominated me. Uh, you know, like I think I can find always sort of find the positive in things. I always see things. I think as a learning 
any experience or as a journalist, you know, you can always discover something in any sort of situation. So I think I can probably sort of find the positive. Maybe that's why he's nominated me. <laughs> it's always good to find the positive in every situation. What's the point in finding the negative, right? A hundred percent. And as you just heard from the last segment, we're all about acts of kindness here on JLGB. And so we always ask what our guests have been doing to help others. Is there a personal act of kindness that you've been doing to help others during this pandemic? Yeah, you know, it's so funny. I was literally listening to that last section and thinking, I wonder if I've done it enough acts of kindness during this time. Um, <laughs> what have I done? Well, it's, it's strange, isn't it? We're sort of in our own little bubbles. And I think one really tiny thing it's just sometimes just sort of thinking I wonder how people are doing especially some of my friends maybe living on their own or you know actually sometimes friends who are living with partners who you think might be you know happy and, and you're not sure so I guess a tiny thing I've been doing is trying to like reach out to people and just you know ask how they are I've spent quite like a lot of time joining zoom parties and going on house party you know and like having like zoom calls and like, I think because I can get into my groove of writing and I can be a bit on my own, sometimes I'm reluctant to give up my, my sort of mental focus. But actually, yeah, so I guess I've checked in with a lot of people is what I've been trying to do to try and um, stay positive. And uh, I also today, so like I'm in, in sort of a weirdly lucky position, I'm moving house. So I'm like one of the only people allowed out the house during lockdown. So, <laughs> so I've been driving a little bit to go and see these houses. And um, today I bought loads of nice food and dropped it at my friend's house. So there we go. Oh. That was an act of kindness. <laughs> Always good to keep in touch with friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's travel all the way back to the very beginning. And um, so do you mind telling us about your childhood growing up and the youth opportunities that you had that shaped you into the person you are today? How did this set you on your path to a career in journalism? Oh, wow. Um, well, in your wonderful intro, there was a tiny bit that was wrong, which is um, I didn't grow up in London. I grew up first of all in Wales and then in Somerset. Um, so actually I was a sort of, you know, small town girl and I was very nervous about the idea of coming to London and like the big city. And I think it wasn't until I really, really desperately wanted to be a journalist I thought I would sort of go to London and that would be um well that's where all the newspapers are isn't it so that was sort of where I had to go um so well, opportunities um I don't know I mean I guess I don't write or talk about it a lot but like I had quite a difficult time when I was little and I'd had you know a difficult relationship with my parents and stuff was quite complicated so it wasn't like a, a sort of easy you know, story and it wasn't a straightforward route into journalism, but sort of a lovely thing that I've learned, like a really lovely thing that I've learned over time is that things that I thought were quite difficult growing up have like really like enriched me and taught me stuff, you know? So I guess like in my job now, I have to go and interview, you know, one day you're interviewing the captain of a ship and the next day you're interviewing a single mum. And the next day, you know, you're talking to like someone who's dealing with a mental health problem. And the next day you're talking to the CEO of a company and I think because I had a lot of experiences that were quite challenging when I was young like actually the plus side is it has made me quite open to like talking to different people you know that's your job as a journalist so I think at the time um I didn't see it like this but like looking back I look um looking back like um actually I sort of see those as opportunities do you know what I mean so things that were quite difficult um one thing when I first got into journalism is I wrote a lot about like what you'd call youth issues, but like young people going through stuff, right? So like I've talked to young bi people. I did a big piece about like young trans people. Um, I did a big piece about young people with bipolar. And obviously that meant like going and meeting them and like sitting down and chatting to them. And I think because, yeah, I was a young person who had my own stuff going on. As a journalist, that's like it enabled me to like go and meet them and be able to you know talk to them openly and like level with them and like they've been happy to share their stories with me so um that's probably me my positive thinking again but I think there wasn't like a ton of opportunities but like in hindsight some things I found very challenging as a teenager turned out actually to give me huge opportunity as a grown-up because I feel like I understand what it's like to, for things to be tricky as a teenager. some setbacks definitely yeah. <laughs> is that a good answer and you realize yeah like I think you know it's often you see things um 
you see things as what, what, what doesn't get you where you want to go and what makes things difficult. And like, it's funny how looking back, you're like, oh, actually that was like a real challenge. But do you know what? Like it's made me who I am. Like it's made me able to like sit down, you know, sometimes you're sitting with people with all sorts of problems and, and asking them to share their story with you. It's a huge thing for someone to appear in a newspaper, like a massive thing. And a lot of people are very nervous about doing it. So I think it's quite amazing I feel that now I can go quite honestly into a space and say, hey, I've been there too. And, you know, do you want to talk about this? Or So weirdly, those challenges anyway turned out to be a sort of positive thing now. Uh, so you started your work in the Daily Mail. So mm -hmm. what was it like uh, you getting your first full-time writing job? So looking back five years later, what advice would you then give to your younger self and what advice do you have for young people that want to get into the same career you're in? Okay, so going back before that, when I was at university, um, I was broke, I was at university, I would have taken any job there was. And so I took a job as an estate agent. So I'm sitting there being honestly the worst estate agent you can imagine, because I just had no idea. I didn't, I couldn't even drive. So I was just walking to these viewings. And in the estate agents, we had a magazine for estate agents. And I was reading it all the time thinking this is, really terrible um so anyway I, I basically contacted the owner of that and said please let me write this magazine I could write you a much funnier sort of piece about what it's like to be an estate agent so that is actually how I got my first job as a journalist I started writing for this estate agent magazine and I would um I wrote a diary of a estate agent and then sometimes I wrote pieces about houses um so I think what I learned from that was two things one is You've got to be up for doing anything you know like I didn't walk into having often young people who want to be journalists or like who doesn't want to write a column about their life right so like often people are like oh how do you get a column or how do you get this um and the, the answer is you've got to be willing to do anything initially I think um oh no saying my internet's can you hear me am I terrible yeah yeah we can hear you. <laughs> okay right so I think that's my first advice you've got to be willing to do anything you know when I did start at the mail I was like so so junior I wasn't writing anything at all my job was actually printing off stories other people had written and just like walking up to the editor's office with them um so like journalism is not glamorous initially so be open to doing anything um is the first sort of thing and then the second thing is you've got to put yourself out there you know even now even now I will email an editor oh I've got this great idea and they'll email me back and say no that's terrible you can't do it you know and then I'll email another editor oh I've got this wonderful idea you should let me go and do this and they'll say no it's terrible so there's a lot of rejection like really all the time and that has never changed you know even after 15 years of being a journalist it's like constantly you're dealing with rejection but don't let that put you off if you have something you want to write about if you have something you want to say um, I guess my advice would be just to just to keep asking people and and be brave, you know, call people up, write to people, ask people for opportunities. So maybe don't be afraid of rejection. It's like yeah, if you get let down once, you can't let it stop you. The whole you know, if you fall off a bike, no, it should make you more determined, right? Yeah. Uh, so sadly, your father passed away in 2010, but it did lead to an exploration of your identity when you found out he was Jewish. So this was part of a Radio 4 documentary that was released recently called And the Good News Is You're Jewish. What did you learn from this experience about yourself? How have you connected with your culture and your identity? So do you mind telling us your story this far and how you think it got to the position you are in today? Yeah, I didn't hear all of your questions because my internet appears to be terrible. I'm sorry, I'm so lo-fi. Um, anyway, but I heard a bit of it, so I'll, I'll go for it. Okay, so um, you've got to sort of pitch the scene that I grew up in the countryside in Somerset. We didn't, I didn't know anyone Jewish. My mum wasn't Jewish and my parents had divorced. And I was saying to my mum, oh, you know, my dad's Jewish, am I Jewish? And she was pretty straightforward. You're not Jewish, go through your mother. You know, that was the sort of answer for whatever reason. So we never really discussed it. And, and so I'd say to my dad sometimes, you know, can you tell me a bit about being Jewish? You're Jewish because he wasn't practicing. And he had sort of claim not to be interested um, and when he passed away I found myself at a Jewish funeral an orthodox funeral and even though he claimed never to be interested his whole life suddenly it turns out in in his death he was really interested and I knew nothing about so I'm I'm embarrassed to talk to all of you because I know so much less but um so I was very embarrassed to find myself you know reading that they were 
saying the Kaddish, I was like, I don't, I don't know what this is. You know, I had never been in a synagogue or to a Jewish cemetery. So that was my sort of first moment when I realized, oh, right, he's Jewish. I sort of think I'm Jewish. Um, you asked me before how I cope with lockdown. And I guess what I do sometimes is I turn things that are stressing me out into a story, right? So lockdown is difficult. How am I going to deal with it? I'm going to go and find stories about people in lockdown. So I guess I keep, keep busy. So I had, I had been, um, it had had a massive effect on me going to my dad's funeral and discovering he was Jewish. And I sort of wasn't sure how to deal with it. And so in, in my typical way, I thought, oh, this is quite an interesting story. I'll, I'll go and write a story about this because sometimes it's easy to intellectualize things and approach things in that way. Um, so I managed to sort of pitch the idea to Radio 4 um, and they said, yeah, great, you know, go and explore this. And I think I approached it like a story. So quite academically first, you know, oh, I'll, I'll find out where he's from and the genealogy, you know, so I was quite sort of um, academic about it. And of course, as you all know, the thing about Judaism is it gets in your heart, doesn't it? And it, it also is about your family. You know, I hadn't understood it was about the food, for example. So suddenly all these people start saying to me, oh, you must come to, you know, it turned, the funny thing was it turned out all my friends were Jewish and I had never really discussed it with them. So people like Rob were saying to me, oh, come to Friday night dinner, you know? And so there I was having this like experience with him and um, lockdown has been really sad because I was invited to all these different things that I couldn't go to, but yeah, um, people invited me what did I do with people? I went to a synagogue with a friend for like the first time, uh, load, loads of eating, um, <laughs> loads of eating, uh, going to, to different things. Um, and so like, yeah, like through that experience of making that piece of journalism, actually it was a very personally, um, I can't tell you, like I couldn't, for a writer, I haven't even got the words to express how profoundly it affected me, you know, because I thought I was on this sort of straightforward oh, I'll write down a sort of straightforward chronology of discovering my dad's history. And actually, of course, I discovered sort of a piece of who I am and who I want to be in this huge family. Like um, a really beautiful thing that happened was that the Jewish Chronicle were interested that I had made this documentary and they did an interview with me. And all these members of family I didn't know existed started emailing me. So it was like, oh, I'm your long lost cousin from here. And I'm your dad's, um, you know, second uncle from, it turns out the Jewish world is huge sort of huge but small right yeah. so it's like all these people are <laughs> inviting me to go um and yeah I got invited to like Purim which annoyingly got cancelled because of lockdown so my my big discovery about Judaism that was so exciting is it's so much about family isn't it and sort of just being together and I love the way it's about like your act of kindness it's about how you are in the world and um like you know the way you act it's not just about turning up to synagogue it's about how you interact with people so it's had a huge effect on me and you know I try and do a Friday night when I can do it and me and Rob are always sort of getting together if we can and and um doing a Friday night just even lighting candles and mm. having some wine and sitting and eating I just love that aspect of it that it's you know it's about being with people isn't it so it's just like yeah. a big community it's, it's, it's like a big family isn't it yeah and then it's like there's this funny like sort of thing where you oh you're Jewish and then it's like ah oh, it's like in some way we have some connection and you you know that maybe you see the world in the same way or like you just you know have an open heart in like a lovely way so it's just been such a beautiful thing for me because it was it was never in my life and now I feel like I have this massive family. <laughs> Love it. Um, so I'm going to stop speaking for a moment and I'll I'm going to ask, there are some audience questions. So we're going to go to Gaia first for her question. Hi Gaia. Let's get her unmuted. Hello. Hey. Um, Okay, my question is, is what's the, like your favourite story that you've worked on and has anyone been unhappy with the focus of one of your articles? Um, I, don't, um, I mean, the most spoiled thing, and by the way, you have such a beautiful name. I love the name Guy, amazing. Um, I think the best thing about being a journalist, like definitely by a long shot, with especially feature writing, is that you find something you're interested in and then you just get the luxury of exploring it for months. So. That has been, you know, heaven. So I've done so many stories where I've just been like, oh, I'm a bit interested in this. And then, you know, off I go to sort of go and explore it. Um, I got to do the most incredible one. So I heard about, you sort of mentioned it in your intro, 
um, I heard about this roller team, roller derby in Egypt, where all these girls were like playing roller derby. And, you know, being a woman in Egypt comes with its own troubles. Like I, you know, there's, there's certain ways about like the women have to behave. And even if they ride a bike, like people can shout at them, you know, you're a whore in the street, like really women get treated quite badly there. Um, but the girls were like so determined and they were in this roller derby team and some of them were even wore like the full hijab while they skated and I just was fascinated by them so I'd been reading about them online and um, said to my editor this this team is amazing I want to go and meet them so I got to go out to Egypt and like meet this team so that was pretty cool and you know obviously the luxury of having a job where you can go and explore stuff like that um, have people I mean really you should ask the people I write about the answer to that <laughs> question I would say um, I'm, I'm very lucky at the Sunday Times that the kind of pieces I'm writing, they're not like fast news stories, you know, I'm not having to like whip something up quickly, like they're very long considered pieces, so they take ages and often when I'm meeting people I have the luxury of like, you know, I get to go meet them, I get to spend time with them, I get that, you know, they can know me before we sort of do the story together. So for example, I mentioned I did a thing about um, a big feature about young kids who were dealing with trans issues and that's like um I mean it was kids who were really young like I think the youngest person I met was five years old and that is like a huge thing for a family to go through right and it's a big thing from like trust me to talk about so with that for example it's like I got to go and meet the family and spend time with them maybe just go for lunch with them and hang out for a while until they were in a place where they were like right you know let's sort of let's do this so so I would say actually I'm very lucky that often you know like I did a piece last weekend and I was like so happy because someone emailed me to say oh I'm in your story and I just read it and I really loved it and you just think oh phew because because you have to tell the truth right and sometimes telling the truth you're not necessarily going to be totally flattering about the people in the article you know even if you really like them you still want to tell the truth but I think when people read something and they say okay it's like the truth then then they're happy with it so so yeah, I would say, I don't know how everyone feels, but on the whole, people's, people are quite happy, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Gaia. Um, so our next question is going to come from Guy. Hi, Guy. Let's get Guy unmuted. Hi. Hi, Guy. Hi. Yeah, so uh, thank you for coming on. And so I wanted to ask, because you've investigated so many interesting and varied stories, like, as you've mentioned, the role of the women's team in Egypt and things like child obesity, as well as kind of UK gang culture. So I was hoping you could elaborate on your process for writing stories. And then like, how do you know it's going to be a scoop? And how, kind of, how do you kind of start it? How do you find these stories? Uh, um, I, I, I think it might be one of those things like, you know, you can like teach someone to play the piano and they can play it perfectly, but there's no, it's not really that, you know, it's not there. Like I, I sort of feel finding a story might be a little bit like that. Like you just sort of have a feeling, but like on the whole, I would say like what they often say about like how to report a story is that imagine you do a thing, like you watch a play and then you run up a hill and then your friend's at the top and you can hardly talk, but you have to just quickly tell them what it was like. And you say something like, oh my God, the lead actor was like, whatever, or like, oh, I love this. So like often it's just the thing that grabs you and you can't stop thinking about. I mean, a roller derby team in Egypt who skate in hijabs during the revolution, it was like, this is amazing. Who are these girls, right? Um, so sometimes I think if a story grabs me, it's going to grab everyone. So I guess that's sort of um, how I start with this sort of, oh, that's interesting. And then the process is, um, it's just needs must. I mean, it's really, obviously the other part of it is like the typing and the interviewing, but also chasing a story is like super good fun in itself. So um, I'm trying to think of, you know, sometimes I'll go and knock doors, like a thing happened in a village and I'm sort of fascinated. So I might go and literally just knock on the door and hope they don't tell me to you know, F off um, and say, hello, I'm from the Sunday Times. I'm interested in this. Would you be willing to share your experience with me? You know, so sometimes it's like that. Um, I just did that piece about cruise ships and the staff working on cruise ships. And I was sort of, you know, thinking, oh, it's fascinating. This, this diamond princess was this cruise ship and they had a terrible coronavirus outbreak. And it became very interesting as like a 
sort of simile or, you know, for what happened in the rest of the world. So I was like, oh, I'm very interested in cruise ships, but how are you going to find the people who are on the cruise ship, right? Um, so I started going on Instagram and looking at locations the cruise ship had been for pictures staff had uploaded to Instagram, um, which I thought was like pretty innovative. So I was quite pleased with that. So, you know, like maybe you knock on, you know, and also we're in lockdown, so I can't go and knock on doors. Um, so all sorts of ways. I mean, now obviously with Facebook, it's like easy to find people. Often I might work with a charity. So for example, um, I think the piece about young trans children, which I was interested in, I sort of thought, well, there must be charities working around this issue. So went and found a charity that was working with it and said, you know, would you be willing to work with me on a piece? Um, so basically just keep going, like, but often knocking doors or going up to people in the street and saying, you know, <laughs> what do you think of this? Like one of the really basic journalism jobs you get, like one of the first jobs they give you usually is what they call vox popsing, which is like where you literally just stop someone in the street. So it might be like, right, well, we're doing a piece about what people think about Brexit. So your job as the baby journalist is to stand in the street at Waterloo Station and just corner people and be like, what do you think about, you know? So I think main thing is just to ask people, you just keep asking people and eventually someone says, oh yeah, actually, I've got, I don't, you know, someone talks to you. I don't know. I don't know if that's much of a process. So then I gather all that and write it up. I mean, that's that's it, basically. <laughs> Thanks, Guy. Um, so the next question is going to come from Keely. Hi, Keely. Hi, Sydney. Um, my question is about your journey on the Trans Mongolian Railway. Uh, the train journey from Moscow to Beijing, it went viral on Twitter um, and you travelled with Rob Ryder, a previous guest on Journey Virtual. Can you tell us a bit more about what it was like, both the journey itself, but also going viral? Uh, yeah, so um, I had just broken up with someone and Rob had just broken up with someone. <laughs> and because of that, I ended up moving into his house. Long story. Um, so anyway, so we're living together and we're like, what should we do at Christmas? <laughs> and I was saying, I hate Christmas because I don't get on with my family and, you know, um, I don't really want to be in England and, you know, he's Jewish, so he wasn't that bothered about Christmas either. So we were like, let's go on holiday. And then I think it became like a one up ship where it's like, well, we should go to Mongolia. Oh, well, we should go to Mongolia via China, you know, so this ridiculous. Um, so eventually we're like, let's take the Trans-Mongolian Railway across like half the world and uh, that'll be what we do for Christmas. So we sort of, that was the first plan, which is we'll do this ridiculous trip. So as we got on the train, I mean, it was, it was just amazing because it was minus 30. It was like so cold. I just never experienced anything like it. But you, you breathe and you can just see all your breath in the air and like your eyelashes are freezing. I mean, it's like crazy, crazy cold. So we're getting on this train. It was this beautiful scene of the trains and it was all snowy and I sort of took a picture and then I like tweeted it like you do. And um, then, you know, the train took off and I tweeted another couple of pictures and Rob, who of course is very famous, was like, oh, you know, I don't want to be in your Twitter feed, like don't include me. So I was tweeting a couple of pictures and then we woke up in the morning and my phone had sort of broken. It was going so mental. And I was like, oh my God, like, I can't remember. Thousands of people in Russia had seen my tweets and just were like retweeting them and it was all going, at which point Rob was like, I want to be in the Twitter feed. I do want to be and I've changed my mind. So then I start like including pictures of Rob who obviously is like well known. So I think it was a combination of Russian people just seemed to think it was hilarious that these two mad English people had taken this awful trip across. I mean, it was incredible, but like mad freezing cold trip across like the whole of Russia. Um, so they all started following it, maybe because it was Christmas and people weren't doing anything. They started following it. So first of all, the phone was just exploding. And but um, because there's a live translate feature on Twitter, it meant Russian people could message me. So Russian people were messaging me in Russian and getting really involved in this discussion. Um, and then we started getting off at train stations and there would be like a camera crew there from the local Russian TV station just being like, oh, you're doing this crazy trip and can we interview you? So it was, um, you know, like you were asking like what a story is and I was like, oh yeah, I'm a journalist. I know what a story is. But actually I had no idea, like no idea anyone would be as interested in, um, in that story. And it just sort of was genuinely like an organic thing that just sort of exploded. I can't remember 
what the numbers are, but like millions of people saw it by the end, which was like insane. So, and people all over the world were sort of, and even now, which must be like a couple of years later, sometimes I'll get a message being like, oh, I've just seen this thread. So yeah, it was quite fun going viral. It was, I would recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Keely. Uh, so our next question is going to come from Josh. Josh unmuted. Hiya. Um, in one of your most recent articles, uh, you talked about your thoughts on sort of moving away from London once lockdown's over. I'm a, I'm a lifelong Londoner, but I'm about to move away for uni. Um, so I found this particularly interesting. Could you talk a little more about this article? Ah, uh, oh, right, where are you going? Uh, hopefully to Nottingham. Oh, right, okay, all right, cool. Um, I didn't know Nottingham, although I looked at Nottingham University actually, um, but didn't end up going there. Um, I guess so, well, I mentioned I'm viewing houses, like I'm one of the only people allowed at the house, so I guess, uh, like I didn't grow up in London and I didn't really want to be in a city particularly, so I guess I'm almost the opposite of you. Um, but then I was sort of went there under duress to be a, a journalist. And then of course in lockdown, I've been in this tiny flat sort of going mad you know, madly writing my pieces, trying to keep busy, um, but also going crazy and then dreaming of the countryside and open space. So I just thought, oh my God, I'm gonna do it. So I just, in this moment of enthusiasm, put my flat on the market and just started like looking at properties and thought, why not? Because actually one, um, one thing I guess I get to do a lot is like travel all over the country interviewing people. So it's not like I need to be in London. I can't imagine, Rob's a lifelong Londoner and he is horrified by the idea of me going to the country. Like, I think I took him to like Soho Farmhouse, which is some really upmarket, you know, members club. And, and that was about as country as he could get. You know, if he sees a field, he sort of has a panic attack. So um, he just, can't, he doesn't understand at all. I, are you like this about London? Like, I think some Londoners, they're just like, about the country. <laughs> No, but like, um, I think with Corona in particular, you know, like I love the idea of just open space and like, oh, in London now, it just feels so packed for me. And also, do you know what? Like, I love, I love culture. Like I love art. I go to the theater all the time. Like that's what I love about London. And now we can't do that. I'm like, I don't know why I'm in London. And I think I mentioned to Sydney, like, I, so I was saying, I've been doing loads of like house party, like conversations with my friends. And then I've got really into Zoom theater which is like people are doing these mad productions on Zoom where the actors are all in different places. And I'm starting to be like, and I saw um, this friend I know who's a graffiti artist did like this live like performance of him making art. So I think there's some really like genuinely exciting stuff happening online that is making, needing to be in a city. It's like, it's suddenly it's not necessary anymore, right? Like my, my meetings, my editorial meetings, you know, you have to be like in London, go meet the editor. Now they're doing them all via Zoom. So I'm sort of like, that piece was partly about like me craving being in the country, but like I'm, fa I'm fascinated about how the world's gonna change. Like, don't you think there's a new thing going on where it's like, why do we have to be in cities anymore? Like very, like this, I mean, like, I don't, I don't know, but I imagine people are from everywhere as once upon a time we would have had this meeting and it was like, we all have to be in London at eight o'clock. Like, can we all get into this particular room? And I'm quite excited. Like, I think the, the real plus side of lockdown is like discovering actually there's like all this stuff we can do I mean of course I feel embarrassed because of course your generation already knew this like I just discovered that you could do all this cool stuff online <laughs> like you probably were all on a house party anyway right <laughs> so uh I think that's that <laughs> no but like I had to install it on my phone you know I've only just got zoom like I am pretty lo-fi if I can avoid doing stuff but now even my granddad is like let's have a zoom call so the world is changing and that's like really exciting to me and I'm excited to see whether cities will have the same purpose anymore. That's I mean, you are right, <laughs> there are people on, I mean, this meeting in particular from all over London, not in London, Liverpool, Birmingham. So it really is brilliant to have everybody online. Yeah, right. So where was your audience before? Did you all have to have to come together in London and this has changed it or? So we've always had an audience from out of London, from all over but to have big meetups and all like that, everybody came to London. So it's really lovely to do this and obviously nobody has to move. 
yeah i think it's i interviewed this like irish theater company the other day right and they're like in rural northern ireland and they were like yeah people are watching in new york people are watching in like Glasgow like some girl in New York watched with her dad who was like in like Wales or so I, but I'm fascinated by this and I think it's I think my piece was like, like is it the end of the city and I'm sort of like maybe it is the end of the city mm. uh, so speaking of that our next question is from Alice hi uh, uh, this is a bit of a long question so <laughs> try and keep with me um, <laughs> For a long time before lockdown, the print media industry was suffering with decreased readership and lower ad revenue due to the digital revolution. What do you think the future of the industry um, will be after coronavirus? With the virus stopping many usual readers from reading an actual paper, is this having a disastrous effect on an already struggling industry or medium? Probably. <laughs> yeah um, I get asked sometimes to go and do these things at schools or like you know about how to be a journalist and I think I always sort of start with you know I didn't really plan to be a journalist I wanted to earn loads of money so I had planned to be a, a barrister and then got sucked in you know to just how fun it is to sit around the house writing all day um mm -hmm. and getting to nose around people's lives like I I it's, it's so tricky, isn't it? Like, I love journalism, I love writing, but like, I think it is a really hard time. Um, obviously, you know, the internet and the fact that people can like access really fast news now, why would you wait till Sunday to go and read the news? Um, mm -hmm. Like, or even wait till the next day to go and buy a paper when it's like, sometimes you buy, I won't name a paper, but um, <laughs> like, and you've already read what's in it on the internet the day before. So I think that is like an interesting question. I think, the way papers are doing something interesting is when they really offer something that like it's not being offered online. Like I've got some like, um, let's say restaurant reviewers who like I love. So yeah, of course, like I could read endless trip advisor reviews, but like if I love someone's writing and they're really funny, that's what sort of papers maybe do really well. Um, the sort of stuff I do sometimes, which is these really big investigative pieces, you know, so let's say the one about the cruise ship, you know, it takes weeks to get all the interviews to find all these different people to like pull that sort of information together and present these long reads that are like 4,000 words long. Um, and it's not just a luxury for me to do it, it's a luxury to read it. Like I love, you know, like when you buy Vogue and even the adverts are good, like the glossy pages. Yeah, you like, can tell that like so much thought and preparation has gone into it. Yeah, like the, it's a product, right? Like it's like it's like buying a dress or, and I think that's not a girl thing. Like I think boys are the same with like, you get a flight, don't you? And you buy GQ or like, so I think what papers are doing or media is doing when it survives is providing something you literally can't get online. So it's not like, oh, the shock of, oh great, here's a news story. Yeah, I can get the news, I can sit on Twitter when it's happening. But like what mm -hmm. I can't get is oh, a thoughtful opinion or maybe someone has an insight or maybe someone really taking the time to give me a like full 360 you know view on something so um will papers survive like I think if they do and actually I was talking um a bit about the zoom theater and stuff but like I'm, I'm really like obsessed with like how technology is changing stuff like the new york times has done some like really fascinating in-depth so like long form pieces but then maybe as you're reading it like a 3d graphic image is like showing you this world oh. of or like I think the Guardian did one about a fire and it's like you can hear the sounds of the fire as you're reading so oh, amazing yeah, yeah. There's, like, there's cool stuff that can I think papers are only just beginning to understand what they can or even or even like I'm reading the piece and then I'm listening to like the sound of the interview like oh, just, yeah really, yeah really, you can like have things playing at the same time and like videos of like if there is a yeah. fire it's like the, the videos of the fire and then you can read like all the information about it right it's right it's very cool I think yeah. that is cool and I think that's the stuff that papers are starting to understand that they can do that like actually is like really exciting like I think we've barely I think we've barely touched the surface of like cool Ooh. stuff like that that can be done well, thank you anyway yeah experience <laughs> <laughs> thanks Alice um our next question is from Jamie hi there um the spread of fake news has reduced the public's faith in news media outlets around the world um, social media has also repeatedly come under fire for allowing false information and problematic news articles to be shared without filter or proof. Do you think that social media platforms and other online media have a responsibility to take these down? 
and how do you think that trust can be rebuilt with the online media? God, that's so difficult, isn't it? Wasn't there a thing about Twitter has started fact-checking Trump? And, you know, there's like yeah. a whole discussion of, like, and so I, I, I remember like watching when I think Jack Monroe sued Katie Hopkins. And I sort of at the time, even though of course we're all supposed to hate Katie Hopkins, felt really weird about that. Cause I was like, oh, I think of Twitter as like a pub conversation where like, I'm just chatting away with people. And like the idea you could get sued for saying something felt like quite petrifying. And so, yeah, like on the one hand, I think Trump shouldn't just lie on Twitter and it's right to correct him. On the other hand, do I want Twitter to become a formal place where, do you know what I mean? It's like, if yeah. I say something, someone intervenes and says, oh no, well you got, you know, cause the, the truth is people go on there to chat and to like make, there's like a million worlds going on on Twitter and you know, people go on after a couple of drinks and it feels like a pub to me where people are throwing ideas around. So that is really, I mean, I don't know the answer. I think it's a fascinating area, isn't it? Should, mm. should we fact check that stuff? Should we keep it casual? Like, I, I don't know, like, um, in terms of paper, I, I guess I just find it, I obviously went from being an estate agent to a journalist. So, you know, one career where they hate you to the next. <laughs> <laughs> like, where there's no trust in, like my experience of journalism, like when I write those big Sunday Times pieces, I write them, they go to one editor who, you know, just like reads them through and maybe has an opinion about the story. But they also go through a whole like fact checking process where the subs like go through, oh, like, Honestly, I roll my eyes, but like they're obviously saving me and go through every number and say, how do you know this? Where did you get this? Show me this. So like, I guess I personally am in the sort of system where I'm getting fact checked quite a lot. And if there was any mistake, like the Sunday Times has to issue a correction. So like, I guess it, I think it's really good. I go through that process and I think it's really sad when I see people talk about fake media and because my experience of journalism is that stuff is being fact checked and that, and that certainly my experience of media is that no one's trying to put out stories that are fake. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I guess I'm not working, you know, like I, I guess there's a, a middle ground, isn't there, between the Sunday Times and Twitter, which is random online publications. Like blogs can say stuff and just whack stuff up. And I don't know who's fact checking it at all. Like, wasn't mm -hmm. there that um, Gwyneth Paltrow, just she's got that silly um, holistic, like sort of eco, -y, whatever, anyway, hippie blog. And like, didn't she sort of proudly say, oh, we don't fact check as if it was like something <laughs> to, like be really proud of <laughs> just think like we're giving people information about how <laughs> their health um I don't know if I have like yeah I haven't got some great solution to the fake media problem I think it's really sad but I think I actually do think that now more than ever like with coronavirus with Brexit with what's happening with Trump what we really need I mean we've seen haven't we is we need great journalists asking difficult questions and I think when we really need that it is like a shame there is such a distrust in the media because what we need is like a really strong impartial media asking difficult questions. So like, I, I just, I, I don't know how you, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> asking, yeah. <laughs> but thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Amazing, thank you, Jamie. Um, our next question is from Simone. Hi, uh, well, I think this question's already been, you know, answered, but just for clarity, uh, follow on, following on from that question, it wasn't that long ago that social media um, was considered the scourge of society, just a few months ago, in fact. Considering the bad press over, over the years, be it misinformation, abusive or hateful speech and cyberbullying, has digital connectivity now become an unsung hero of this pandemic and kept us all sane? Has which connectivity? Digital. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's a really tricky one, right? So like, um, I went viral on Twitter, great, with my little thing. And yeah, I really avoid Twitter now. Like, um, obviously that was wonderful, but like, I find it a really, I find it as a professional journalist, really scary space. Like you can't just say, oh, hey, here's an idea, guys, that I'm sort of thinking through without people just being like, rah, and like attacked, and you're so afraid. Like, some of my friends will sometimes say to me, oh, what do you think will happen if I tweet this? Or am I okay to tweet this? Like, it used to be this lovely pub conversation where you'd have a, a chat away, and now it feels like it's a really um, quite scary space. And, and in fact, I saw um, my auntie uh, on Facebook the other day saying leaving Facebook it's become really toxic and I thought what well, Facebook which I think of as like a really soft space right so 
I completely get all of those discussions about digital. And yet at the same time, like I'm so excited about, um, well, like you've, like I said, like I, like I'm fascinated by this thing. I could bore you with like sending you a link to like Zoom theater. I think people are using technology in these like amazingly innovative ways. Like I'm super into this thing called Pearl Poetry, which is like people use a programming language, to, like write poems, you know, that people are, um, yeah, they're doing like live sort of creating paintings or like, yeah, I love that um, Zoom theater. And I think that journalism, oh, there's just look at the way podcasts has taken off. Like this sort of radio felt like it was dead and podcasts now weirdly feels like a new medium that I think is telling stories in like really exciting ways. So, so I just think it's, you know what? Like the answer to everything is always, it's never one or the other. Like it's a complicated answer. Sorry to be boring and, and not, um, <laughs> not, you know, clickbaity enough, but it's not that all, me, all social media is awful, is it? It's not that all technology is bad. It's like some technology is like amazing. And, and I'm just so like genuinely excited about the things that technology is doing, but at the same, and it's brought us together. Like and I don't feel half as lonely during lockdown because I'm on these Zoom calls all the time and I'm constantly like video calling with people. And, and in fact, you know, the reason I feel I can move to the countryside is because I'm like, well, I can just meet up with my friends on house party. Like it won't be, um, so, so technology is wonderful. And at the same time, it is also really toxic and evil. What can you do? Like, <laughs> I think it's both. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Alex. Hi there. Um, so in Sydney's introduction, she mentioned that you won the Young Stationers Prize and you were shortlisted for the and yeah, you were shortlisted for the best feature writer at the British Press Awards. How does it feel to be rewarded like that for your industry? Um, do has it helped your career? Has it made you stand out more from other journalists? And do you think there's a lot more pressure on you now, now that you've been rewarded by um, your industry. No, no, there's enough pressure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, some of them were nominations. I like to call myself like award nominated journalist, you know, as opposed to like award winning. Um, <laughs> like there have been a lot of nominations and only like a couple of wins. Like I think some of my favorite journalists of all time haven't won any awards at all. So that's what I, I try and do, but obviously, yeah, obviously you want to like win prizes. I don't know if it makes a big difference. I know someone who won the feature writer of the year, the year she got sacked from the paper she was working for. I, mean, <laughs> I think in theory it should work in a straight line, but I think it probably doesn't always work like that. Fair enough, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, our next question is from Hannah. Hi. Um, as a pioneering woman in journalism and broadcasting, you have set the way for future young women to follow in your footsteps. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences and how they may have changed women in the media? And what more do you think we still need to do? And also, if you have any advice for young women that you wish you knew when you started? Uh, yeah, I have got a great bit of advice. When I started, um, Julie Bircher was like my sort of hero and encouraged me to become a journalist. Um, so I suppose we would say she's problematic now. But anyway, um, one thing she always says to me was, don't write about your sex life. Don't write about your relationship. She said, as a young woman, and this is so true, the first thing people will ask you to do is write about your relationships and write about your sex life. But like, boys aren't being asked to write that shit, right? Sorry. But like, they're not, I think it's often women get asked to write that stuff and the men aren't being asked to write it. And the problem, you know, can be that if you forge a career always writing about your relationships, you know, always writing those sort of columns, you never sort of get given or get to become a sort of serious journalist, right? Um, which I guess, you know, I don't know if I'm a serious journalist, but like I wanted to write big pieces that are about like news stories. So she gave me that advice and, and now, and I, I listened to it. And so for years, yeah, I didn't really write about my relationships and you'd get called up and asked, oh yeah, will you write about how awful it is to break up with blah or, you know, someone you've slept with or a bad experience. And I would sort of say no to those pieces. And I think it was a really good advice because especially as a young woman, like you get seen a certain way. And like now, if I get asked to do them after I've done pieces about child murderers and pieces about, you know, I don't know, serious news stories, like, yeah, I will write a piece about how terrible it was to break up with someone and I don't mind because I don't think I'll get seen a certain way. But like, it is true. I think women often get asked to write those pieces in the ways men don't. And so maybe, maybe you do have to sort of force yourself a bit more not to go down that path. Um, 
you know, like to turn down maybe to the same extent, like beauty stories or fashion. Like, I don't know anything as you can tell about beauty and fashion. And like, I got asked to write about them because I'm a girl and I would always say, oh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I ended up writing instead a Carl column, which was great, um, which I also knew nothing about. But like, what I don't, I don't think women should see themselves in particular roles or should feel they have to write about certain subjects. Like, I think we should, you know, and sometimes maybe you do have to be a bit more forceful than men would about saying, actually, I don't, you know, I don't want to be seen that way, especially when you're a young woman. There's a bit of, uh, yeah. So I guess I would say that as advice. I can't remember what the other thing was. I can say that I've worked with some amazing women and I think journalism is really, really changing. And actually nearly all of my editors now are women. So when I hear about sexism in the media, I feel quite lucky that I'm in a position where nearly all the women who, all the people commissioning me are women and a lot of the people who've helped me with my career are women. And um, I think things are really changing. You know, the editor of the Sunday Times is now a woman, the magazine editor is a woman, the news editor is a woman. So yeah, I think things are changing. <laughs> Thank you, that's all really positive. <laughs> Good luck, are you gonna be a journalist? Um, still open, but it's a potential. Or go for something with more money. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Um, and then our last question from the audience is from Jake. Hi, Katie. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, following on from that, so in 2013, you launched The Other Club, which was a pop-up ladies-only club, although men were allowed, that sort of flip or seeks to flip the usual balance in the workplace and many social ventures uh, which to, were to ensure that women are the majority in the audience. Can you tell us a bit more about how you came to founding the club and what your aspirations are for moving forward? Yeah, well, um, I'm afraid The Other Club does not ex sort of exist anymore, although sometimes we've done festivals and stuff. Um, I think... So me and my best friend just sort of hang out together. And then we would talk a lot about, I think around the time we started it, there had been a real discussion about looking, about representation of women. And when you look at like panels, you know, you'd often not sort of see women on them. Um, and then we were like throwing around this idea, oh, maybe we could, you know, like in London, they talk about like old boys clubs. We were like, oh, maybe we could have like an old girls club or maybe we could just have like a space for women. And then obviously we were like, oh, that's a bit rubbish. Don't we just hang out with women all the time. So then we were like, how about a setup where only women are talking, but anyone can come. So the audience is men and women and it's like mixed, but like it would always be women talking. And then she's like quite a sort of um, serious, quite, sometimes quite political journalist. And like, obviously I'm sort of me. Um, and so I guess that combination made it quite fun. So for example, we had a debate that was um, Playboy bunnies. So we got these Playboy bunnies from the Playboy club and they came and had an argument with these feminists about <laughs> like basically like, you know, who was right and what the job involved, what was acceptable. And so like, yeah, the idea was that all the women would be like speakers, all the women would be the speakers and then anyone, anyone could watch. So it's sort of, um, I think it maybe made of course the men came because it was full of women um and I think maybe by watching the interesting women speak it made them just think about how they would go to events you, you don't even notice do you? you go somewhere and it's like a whole panel of men I don't really notice so it was like you know I think interesting to flip that on its head thank you very much very interesting well how come uh, very quick question how come how come you, you stopped it so like how it started is yeah it sort of started and then my friend found this um like pop like basically like a shop that was empty and managed to like get us like a pop-up space there so we ran it like for a while and that was like did really well and then we were trying to find a permanent space just like expensive to find a permanent space in London so having done it as like this pop-up because I think we got the space for free um then we like took it to a couple of festivals and sometimes we'll do like an other club stage but yeah I suppose that and being busy and lazy <laughs> as we all are <laughs> yeah Thank you very much, Casey. That's all right. Thanks, Jake. Um, so that's it for audience questions. So just two more from me. Um, what's next for you? Um, what do you think the future has in store for you? I don't, I don't know. Who knows, hey? Um, I just did the radio thing and I really enjoyed doing it. And I guess after a long time of sort of writing, it was just like a really new, you know, like, yeah, it was a new medium to sort of explore. So I loved doing that, so I think um, that. There is like um, a sort of discussion about maybe turning one of my articles into a drama, so who knows, maybe maybe something like that will happen, I know, ooh. Um, 
I guess like I'm just sort of exploring writing exploring I'm, I'm trying to think if I'm working on any exciting stories but I probably can't tell you till they come out so top secret <laughs> <laughs> um, so finally we always ask our guests to nominate and ask another celebrity or community leader to be a future guest on our program like what Rudder did for you oh, and right, so right. if you've enjoyed tonight's experience who do you think you want to nominate oh wow that's such a difficult question how I didn't know that was coming oh no was that when Rob nominated me um, yeah put you on the spot I want so many people who, who, what are, what are the sort of options? Like, it's just literally anyone who I know. Anybody. <laughs> we want to entertain, we want to entertain children while in lockdown. So, anybody. I mean, my mind's gone blank because I thought of everybody. Um, I don't know. I would probably get <laughs> inspired by Rob. I would try and get a member of One Direction. Um, <laughs> that is, we would love that. <laughs> would you? Yeah, so would I. Hi. I'd be fascinated to know what they've been getting up to in lockdown. Try and get Harry Styles. Or get Lizzo. Oh my God, that's who I'd get. <laughs> well, have a think. Let us know. <laughs> I will. Thank you but so much for having me. It's been so fun. Thank you for coming on. It's been a really amazing interview. So thank you for joining us this evening and for inspiring us all. We've really loved hearing about your career and experiences. And we've loved hearing about how you discovered your identity. So good luck with all that comes next. And we hope to read more of your work very, very soon. Stay safe, take care, and we hope to speak to you soon. I will. You too. Look after yourself. <laughs> Thank you. So that's it. Thank you to everyone for tuning in this evening and yet again being part of history. A quick reminder, we're looking for everybody to get involved. So if you have a special skill and you want to teach it on a JLGB virtual, please email virtual at jlgb.org to get involved. And we'll be back tomorrow when we're doing another fun interactive quiz, some club aside with Lisa, before an amazing Learn to Code Skills Club with Josh and more acts of kindness with Georgie. We'll then be hearing from the inspirational philanthropist and businessman, Gerald Ronson, CBA. Until then, keep well. Thank you so much for joining and good night.